how could I start? I'm born in the 70s. My first years of schooling was in South Edland. I did about four years up there from 1980, 81. Um, loved going to 80 Mile Beach, Finnegan Island, getting mud crabs. Um, from there, I moved to Perth. Back, I'm from Perth, but we went to um, South Edland because we were getting away from violence. Um, the family feuding between our tribal groups, our families down here were pretty, pretty um, horrific at, um, at one stage. Um, so we left Perth and a lot of our people left Perth because of the feuding. Um, some went to Adelaide, some went to other areas, Melbourne and so forth. And um, if you think of the Native Americans, you'll think of a couple of tribes, usually because they were fierce. And the South West Aboriginal is known to be a fierce tribe, a very um, a wild card. And um, you just have to look in the prisons in Perth. They're littered with my family members, littered with my cousins, littered with my family enemies that are my own people but they're in big numbers. Um, but anyways, um, my grandmother lived um, over 20 years up in the northern gold fields. So I spent a lot of time up in Linster, Leonora, Agnew, and um, seen a lot of the mob over that way or in the gold fields and how they were struggling. You know, I was going to Leonora to the pub and it had the black side and the white side. And I was thinking, well, I'm a half caste. Which side, is I, which side am I going to go, you know? Um, so that was my little joke as a young young fella there. Um, spent a couple of a uh, couple of years in Melbourne, um, some schooling there. Did some schooling in the Northern Goldfields, in the Pilbara, in the Kimberleys, and we were uh, travelling a lot because my stepfather, um, he he worked in heavy machinery, and with his years and years of experience, he helped develop the uh, the highway between Broome and Port Hedland on the main roads. Latent contractors were laying the stuff where the big rivers are all along there. And I remember the time even when um, Newman to Headland was still dirt track and that was fun, especially cyclone season when you'd be stuck there for a couple of days. Um, but they were fun experiences that, I've, that I had, you know, ch um, hunting the goanna. Any of you taste the goanna? Up north they say bungara or kara uh, or barney up in, um, dep depends on what, what area, barney's up Broomway and Bungara is the Western Desert way, and down this way we say Karada. So just to taste the guana, just to let you know, it's, it's not chicken, it's not fish, but it's somewhere in between. And um, if you can, get out there and try and catch one and have a feed. Um, yeah, connect. So yeah, so that's a bit about my family upbringing. So I've been all over the place, and I've seen remote, regional, and city metropolis type living. Um, so it was an experience from moving from Port Edland to Melbourne for an, as an experience in, in just in regards to weather and rocking up with shorts and a shirt and no shoes because I love wearing no shoes. So if you go to Carousel, see me with no shoes, that's just me connecting with the Buja, with the land. Um, vulnerability, emotions. Um, I've had good and bad experience with, um, with wedgelers, with white people, and I'm sure white people have had mixed experiences with Aboriginal people. So we've all shared that interactions as, as human beings, that we've all experienced the good and bad of any culture. Even Aboriginal people, I've had good and bad experiences. So, so you know, like um, with vulnerability, you know, sometimes like it's good to, you know, share, but be careful of your vulnerability because of those triggers that you may have as well. So just, um, is it, but personal stories, as I'll probably get into, it, it's good to share um, and, and it's good because that's how we learn, I guess. So don't be scared, but also be mindful of your own, your own um, stuff as well. But generally speaking, don't hold back. There's no wrong, wrong or right answer. I've got big shoulders. Um, just have a yarn. Um, so creating a, that's that creating a safe learning environment here. Um, we're just here to try and give you some, some tools, strategies, um, and how to help people and they include Aboriginal people. So, and how to be a good practitioner. So how, you, how do you do that? And I, I can see in the room, we're all adults. So you're, you're doing it. And this is just that continual learning, refreshing, and just going over it again, and just maybe picking up a couple of points that, we, that you've taken it. Because a lot of it's just about 
it's really common sense, but some organisations are just not doing the basics, and that's what I really want to hone in about today, that they miss these, um, these opportunities. And um, I, I think, you know, with racial discrimination, racial discrimination, one third of all racial discrimination that's reported by Aboriginal people has to do with health. So when they go and see their doctor, for an example, so, and they're not getting the, you know, they're getting discriminated. So the doctor might be saying, well, I don't know what I did wrong. It, it's not about what they did, it's how they, the client feels. So you gotta be very careful that you don't, you gotta make the, the client feel safe and comfortable. And that's what I'm saying with you here today. I want you to feel safe and comfortable and that um, you, you, you can talk and don't be afraid to talk, but just be mindful that, um, you know, like for an example, personal names, you know, like, cause someone else might know that person and you might be telling that story and it might not be, you know what I mean? There might, might be some issues centered around that person because especially black followers, we don't have six degrees of separation. We have, we have um, probably one, you know, one or two degrees. We all know each other, I guess, one way or another. All right, so just that trainer availability. So I'm here to support um, the provider that you're, that you're enrolled in, and that's what I'm here as, as their, their Aboriginal cultural advisor. So I'm here to help you learn. All right, and just that self-care. Self-care is very important, like which I was just talking about, you know. You know, go home, relax, enjoy, process it, reflect on it today, and um, take away, hopefully take away um, a couple of things. Thank you, Julia. Julia also needs any yep. support at some point. Um, just make sure to reach out again to one of the trainers. So we've got Roy at the back and myself as well. If anyone uh, would want to have a chat, if you need to step out as well, uh, feel free to do those things. But. So when we say welcome, we say wanju, wanju la buja. Nicha buja nande maka manga nini nicha buja kora kora ngan kora chup kara jini cha. Nicha buja wind buja. Nicha buja kora buja. So with the, I'm saying this land is sacred. Nicha nicha buja. This land is wind. It's a it's a sacred land to us. It's a kora buja. It's an old country. When I'm talking about nande maka manga. I'm talking about my maternal grandmother. My manga is my father's side. So when I'm talking about my demma, my demma is my maternal grandmother because that's, I don't belong to my mother or father. I belong to my mother's mother. So you'll see a lot of kids in care, if you ever work in child protection, a lot of those kids live with their maternal grandmother, which is culture. So with her, we get a skin group, our moiety, our, our clan group, our language, our dreaming, our, our, our identity is, is all within our maternal grandmother. So one, which is the woman, has to marry two, which is the man, man and woman. That's our culture. Then the children become three, but three has to marry four to go back to the maternal grandmother. So woman marries a man, their children become three then the three has to marry four to go back to one, which is the maternal grandmother. And that's our way. And then we marry back to our mom, which is our father's people. We marry back like three or four removed. So third, fourth cousin, like as long as, so it, it, that's how that kind of system runs, which is called a skin group. So that one, that's where we get our, our dreaming, our, our moiety, our skin group. So when I'm talking about moiety, there's like in Chinese, they say yin and yang, so black and white. So here we're, everything, be it a plant, be it an animal, be it um, sky, be it land, like mother earth is maternal, yeah? Father is man. So it's like in French, you say li and la. So. French for yum, I don't know, I can't talk French, but anyway, so that's how you learn how our system. And it seems complicated, but once you know it, you understand where you come, who you can help and who you can't help. So even with my um, mother-in-law, I can't even speak to my mother-in-law. It's culture, I have to, it's a total avoidance. 
I'm not allowed to speak to my maternal grandmother, uh, my mother-in-law, which is a good thing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So um, old culture. Now, my people are older than the Aboriginals from up in the Kimberleys. Why? Because we came through, we migrated to Australia. Every country in the world did some sort of movement. The Polynesians, the Melanesians, the Micronesians, and the Aborigines. Yeah, or well, something like that. But anyways, so, when I, so that's uh, to understand, um, that's how we connect to country. So do you know what the people of this area are called? Hands up, do they know? Yeah, what is it? Okay, Wajak, someone said Wajak, keep going. Nyunga. So when you say, say Nyung, Nyunga. Nyunga is a man. So do you just want to be called men? Now I'm just giving you that a tip that Nunga is a man and it disrespects my mother. It disrespects my maternal grandmother. It disrespects my sister. But history is written by the victors. And when you have a people that are going like this, I'm talking about their culture, their identity, because history is written by the victors. So what happens is they grab that, Roy said Wajak, and if I Googled right now, because what you've got to do, right, you've got to go back and you see that Wajak was, was given by a white person that developed the map of Aboriginal Australia that never consulted my people, never consulted my elders. So what he did is um, he got a bloke from Horse Creek. Anyone know how far Horse Creek is? And he said, do you know the name for P the Perth Aboriginal people? And he said, Wadjuri, which is a tribe up north. So, so what I do as an academic and as a smart black fella is I go over things. And what hap what's happening is there's an undercurrent and be mindful, there's nothing wrong with saying Nunga, but that's going to change in the near future, somewhere down the track. And you just need to be patient because my people, we've just sorted out a out of court settlement with the government because when they came to our country, they stole our country and never gave an acre back, which is a, it's a, it's a truth. So the United Nations and the Australian government know they have to do some form of compensation for theft. And that's what native title is. So to legitimize their, their, um, their authority on country, people like the United Nations said, hey, you need to sort out the Southwest. So I'm from the Southwest. This is the Southwest where our country has been stolen. And now we've got to the point where we've negotiated, we've took it, because we, we had to take it out of court because the Australian government was losing and we were losing and both got scared. And so they took it out of court and said, hey, let's try and negotiate something. And that's what our, our elders and our community done with the government to, to, to sort out um, our rights to our land. When I welcome you to country, I, come, I sometimes laugh because I'm like, how could I welcome you to a country that's got, I don't have anything? If I took you to the Pinjarra Massacre right now, I would say that's controlled by the Shire of Murray. It's not controlled by my people. Um, you've got a, you, there's nothing here. There's no protection. There's no, um, there's, there's nothing in place. So when we're talking, today is really about cultural safety. I can take you over the road and I can show you another massacre that's not even known about. I can take you today to Rockness Island and I say we have no control of a 100-year-old Aboriginal prison at Rockness Island where our people are, uh, are in the hundreds have died at Rockness Island and we have no protection. Where my grandfather, um, um, where he spent a lot of time and my step-grandfather, up at Magumba, have you watched the movie The Rap Proof Fence? If I took you there today, you'd be like, I'll pull up and I'll say, oh, we have to jump the fence, we can't get in here. And just to let you know, just on the left 
is a, is, a, is a cemetery. Our people can't even visit our own cemeteries because it's all closed up. So to understand Magumba Mission, that was a place where Aboriginal people were placed, um, removed from various places. So I'll give you an example. Northam, everyone, every Aboriginal person that lived in Northam and Nangrup had to be removed. One was placed at Carolup and the other were placed at Magumba or the Moor River settlement. They were literally removed. The whole community was told to get lost. Even welcome to country is kind of funny when you have no land. But like I said, things are getting sorted out, thank goodness. Um, you know, I remember saying to my grandmother, she passed now, and I said, Nan, no disrespect, I love you dearly, but when your generation goes, our generation will be better off. And um, because, you know, the black-white issue, you know, that era was just, you know, I, I think it needs more, uh, more liberal, I don't know if that's the word liberal, but us younger ones to come through to change things. And I think it's going to change. So there is a movement. But also I want to just let you know about acknowledgement of country. So acknowledgement of country is like an informal setting where you can do as part of your meetings. Um, I always say limit, limit that type of stuff because it's, it's more better to get an Aboriginal person and to do a welcome. But you know, now and then, you know, a lot of workplaces will do an acknowledgement of country when they're doing like maybe a staff meeting or, or, um, or something within their own little um, sections and so forth. But I really advocate that they should be just pushing more just to get a, a, an elder to come in because you're cutting that elder out of a business in a sense as well, because they have the opportunity to not only showcase who they are, but you know, to be paid. And any consultant that you use gets paid. But when it comes to Aboriginal consultants, they think, oh, you should do it for free. Why are you getting paid? And then now people have to justify ourselves. We recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, peoples, as the custodians of this land in which we live, work and pay our respects to traditional owners, elders, emerging leaders, and all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So why do we say Torres Strait Islanders for an example? They're not from Australia's mainland, but they're close, their culture is more closer to Papua New Guinea, but Australia ox occupies it. Same with um, Christmas Island, which is closer to Indonesia, which is part of Western Australia. So, yep, so that's our why. And funny enough, Torres Strait Islander people are proud to be called Torres Strait Islander people. And I said, why are you proud to be Torres Strait Islanders when it's a white man's name? You know, like, what I do is I challenge them, not because he's white and an explorer, but they've latched onto it. Same with Aboriginal people from Queensland. I said, what? You're from Queensland. Why are you proud to be from Queensland? Isn't it your land? So what, what I do is I just kind of challenge them. And I'll give you another example, and I'll say to you, okay, let's look at the word normal. Process it, normal. What's the opposite in the English language? What is the opposite of normal? Okay, Mark, and the rest of you, the opposite of normal is? Okay, so what's the opposite of original? So, so everything that's done is all effed up, back to front, and it's not our language, it's the language of the oppressor. So Sarah said traditional owner. What does traditional mean? Past tense. I say I'm not a traditional owner because I'm not in the past. I'm an ancestral keeper, which is a continuous. So even traditional puts me into a past. Oh, that was your land in the past. You're a traditional owner. And a lot of Aboriginal people will say I'm a traditional owner because the narrative is developed by non-Aboriginal people. And I'm using the word Aboriginal, and I really hate the word, because I'm not an Ab-original, I'm original. But I'm just giving you some stuff to think about. So I'm challenging the narrative, and that's what an Aboriginal trainer does. It says, hey, a lot of this stuff is not because of us. If you want to be honest, we're Bibbulmun people. 
This area here is called Bibo Manbuja. This is what my grandmother put in a newspaper article back in the early 80s. She said she's a proud Bibelman. And we were always taught that. But because of language loss, because you're dealing with stolen generations, people that were removed from their, their, their culture, their heritage, and that's why there's that, because we don't have that cultural authority. So when we get that cultural authority, then we can, um, I guess, develop our concepts and meanings and how we view life, our world view. But we don't have that. We've got Department of Child Protection doing a lot of it. We've got the prisons doing a lot of it. And they're the ones that are controlling our lives. We don't, we don't even have an Aboriginal cultural centre in Perth. We have no land in the southwest. So we, that's why our hands are behind our back. We, were, we are forced to do a dud deal. Trust me, it's a dud deal. To get something for our people. And that's really sad. And we are conditioned. Everyone in this room is conditioned. What's happening here in the Southwest and what's happening in Australia, what's happening in Western Australia. And it's not no fault of your own, but we are just really conditioned because we should, be a, we should be angry. We should be affirmative action. And this is why I love doing this stuff, to say, hey, you know when people did that Black Lives Rally? I said, what, you, black, what, you, what just for one day? I said, I'm, I'm in the trenches every day. I'm doing this every day. And be doing it through, we're gonna do it in a humble way, you know? Before I used to do it through that chip on the shoulder. I used to do this here every day, get that chip off my shoulder. What, what I'm saying to you is, is be patient, be patient first, because our, some of our people still hold that deer, because that's what they know. So when we start, when they, so we're all at different levels. So what I'm saying is just be patient. What I'm teaching you is a gem. That I'm giving you a gem to say, hey, that's not quite right, but just be patient, let our, peop, let our community catch up. So there is an undercurrent where a lot of our people are saying, hey, this is wrong, this needs to be rectified. And the undercurrent is happening and will happen once we get that cultural authority. So because we've had to settle native title, now we can set up a few things that can deal with the language to say we want an Aboriginal cultural centre. Why can't we have one? It, so we, we need visionaries and we need allies. You're an ally. There's a lot of work in this scope where youth can come and say, hey, we want to support. What can we do to help? Hey, we're new to Australia. We see something's gone wrong. How can we help when half to most of the homeless guys are my people? Trust me, half to most of those people that are homeless in Perth are Aboriginal people. And some of them choose to be homeless. So some of them choose to, but not all of them. But same time, oh, 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 sorry, I'll rephrase phrase it, because I don't think that's right. That's the short answer. The real long answer is they need help. They need help. So, you know, we can just stuff it off and say, oh, well, they choose that, you know. But when you really think of it, no, they need help. They really do. It's a sickness. Um, so in regards to Indigenous, there's nothing wrong with saying Indigenous. There's nothing wrong saying Aboriginal. But I'm just hoping that there will be a time in the future where um, we can be called what we actually are, you know what I mean? So, and then, so what it is, what I'm talking about is reconstructing, deconstructing our people. So, you know, because our history has been programmed and darted in. My, my grandmother said she was a half caste. You know, my grandmother said, oh, I'm a, I'm a half caste. And I'm like, man, why are you talking like this? But that's how she was programmed in because that's the, how the system has, how the system was dividing us and, and putting us into these little brackets. But just on that, what's mm. the difference between a mob and a tribe? Because they all refer to them. Same, same. Yep, yeah. It's just, I wouldn't call it lazy English, but it's just a, a way we, you know, it's, it, English is beautiful. We can be called so many things. You know, kingship, you know, clan, you know, um, a tribal group, mob, it's, it's all the same. Yeah. Sorry? Yoga. 
So Nyunga is a man and Yoga is a woman. Nank is our, our mother and Mom is our father, our Kulang or as our child or Kulanga. And you know, that's, that's how you define the kingship and you would understand how people placed within that kingship through our, our stuff. When we become practitioners, or which I would say you already are practitioners, just by looking at you, is that um, we understand power and how, how that can affect your interaction with your clients, with your community, and that we just have to be abakarn, gently, gently, slowly, slowly, work beside our, 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 our clients, our people. Um, so that's really the nutshell about cultural safety, is that to understand and just be respectful, understand the ways of working. And um, when you understand those little things, you'll be, you'll be great workers and you'll be a, value, a, a valued ally within our community. And there's a lot of work in our community. Trust me, a lot of work. We need to close the gap. And I'll give you an example where closing the gap is widening. For an example, is most of the kids that are in, in DCP, in, the, in care of the department, uh, most of them will go to non-Aboriginal um, uh, families. Not because we want that, it's just that's the tread. Because we've got principles that says, any of our kids that are in care, we want them put in relative care. Relative means with family, with mob, yeah? But even our families are struggling, so they have to be placed somewhere. So um, that trend is it's, it's really widening. And that's just an example, I guess. In Australia, we talk about equality versus equity. So if you can look there on that, that's a beautiful example of when we're talking about cultural safety. So you, we, we go into the organisation and we're like, um, a big organisation might be the Department of Health. And they'll go, all right, let's just get 3% Aboriginal people so we can just tick the box. So that's that equality, so we can show that we're getting Aboriginal people through. You know, police department's a great one. My, my son just finished um, a four, four or five year stint. He's now at a Casey prison, working in a, um, a top job there. But um, with, with the, um, with the uh, police, the only way the Aboriginal people can get into the police service is basically start at the bottom and become a, 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 an Aboriginal cadet. And if you're happy, then they'll put you through the academy. So my son, who did year 12, who's very smart and intelligent, instead of going straight to the academy where he, he wanted to go and where he should have went, he got put in the Aboriginal bucket because then they could tick off the police department and say, hey, we've got so many Aboriginal people through this Aboriginal cadetship program. So it's called reverse racism. So my boy should have went straight to the academy. Instead of going to the academy, he went this other way. So, um, but I think, so equality is about sameness. Um, equity promotes fairness, justice by giving everyone the same thing. It can only work if everyone starts from the same place. Aboriginal people did not start at the same place. I still remember eating damper and fat a couple days a week. I remember the fridge being empty a few days a week. I remember having curtains, um, sheets as curtains in my house. And I remember um, that struggle was real and real for a lot of my people. And my, they say 1967 was, um, and we'll get to that, that it was a pivotal moment for our people. So if, if I'm born in 76 and my mother's born in 53, I'm first generation, first Australian. Or not first Australian, Australian. Because they say 1963, uh, 1967, which was a referendum to give Aboriginal people some rights, because there was a big thing back in the 60s with the civil rights movement um, all over the world, particularly um, like America. Um, yeah. So for an example, Perth Airport did a, this billion dollar project and, and they're, they're still working on it. You know, getting that, um, that station done at High Wycombe, um, 
you know, this whole bunch of things. And guess how many Aboriginal businesses are there? Zero. A billion dollar project in Perth. Missed opportunities given to these foreign companies that have no idea how to, um, you know, so when we look in, so with that, the opportunity there that was missed is within the procurement and the pre-planning, where we could have said, no, 15%, 10% of everything has to go to the Aboriginal coffers. So that's in the pre-planning. But what happens is these people will come here when they've already done the pre-planning, done this all year, and then they go, oh, let's, quick, we need, to, we need to engage the Aboriginal people so we can tick the box, which is wrong. That's not cultural safety. <clears throat> so you get the idea? Yep. I was going to have that right at the end to just wind it all off, and I thought, no, I really need it out the front just so you can get that understanding um, where, where we're coming from. Because we can do the business, but we just don't have the assets. We can do the healing and the diversionary program to, for our kids not to go into the prisons. We're the most incarcerated people on the planet. Aboriginal people in Australia are worse than the Maoris in New Zealand. Are they worse than the native or the, the African Americans in the United States? We have the worst in the world for Aboriginal incarcerations. Our people, my cousins, my brother's in there right now, um, or pff, a couple of my brothers. We, if you use the word Centrelink, so what type of payments for Centrelink first? And then I can go, no, I'm not just looking at you, but, okay, so youth, they have stuff for youth. If you're a veteran, you get a specific payment. If you're an older person, you get a certain payment. If you're just unemployed, you get New Start or whatever. Um, but they've set up to support those particular people or vulnerable people. If you're Aboriginal, you don't get a special payment on Centrelink. Just that you just get New Start, for an example. If you're an, do they should do, they should get a special payment, or should they be treated? Well, I, I think they, the money suffice. You know what I mean? To a sense, especially like a young. I'm, I'm only thinking about young people. You know, it's not. You know, it gets. Get some sunny to get by. So I, I think the Australian government in regards to Centrelink, they do a great job. I mean, you go to other countries, they don't have that social buffer to support our people, you know. Even for us to do training, you know, we, we got that, um, that payment there for us, you know. So, um, but sorry, the question was ticking boxes. I just say that it's for data collection, um, that the funding bodies or the, um, the government wants to know. And just to let you know, Aboriginal people, uh, we have no say in government. Right? So everything is, um, is, is, is for them, it's not for us. So cultural safety is about shared respect, shared meeting, shared knowledge. The experience of learning together with dignity and truly listening. St strategic and in, um, institutional reform to remove barriers um, to the optimal health being safety of Aboriginal people. So when we're talking about barriers, well, we talked about some of that already. So um, what, could be a, what could be a barrier? Language? Yep, some of our people, English is probably a second or third language to some of our, our tribal groups in WA. So you've got to be, you know, to have those interpreters, uh, working with your Aboriginal liaison unit, so, say at uh, Fiona Stanley Hospital, they have an Aboriginal liaison unit because a lot of times the, there's a lot of issues going on within um, the hospitals and that's why they're there to be that buffer as a young kid and being served second or third when you were like first in line, you know, and you sit back and go, Hmm. You know, and I'm, I'm this, just this little kid and I'm, a, I'm usually this here type little kid. You know, I, 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 I call it out even as a young kid. But sometimes you just get sick of it and you're like, yeah, go on, you can go. Go ahead, yeah. You know what I mean? And, um, but you just sit back and go, you know, that's rude. And then I learned to say, All right, you know, I'll walk out of the shop. As I got older, I was like, well, I don't, you're not going to get my money. I'm going to another shop. You know, and, and 
my mates, they look more Aboriginal than I do, you know, I used to see them, you know, going through the shops, getting followed around the shops everywhere and, you know, and it's like, man, this is bull crap. This shouldn't be happening, man, you know what I mean? Um, and then, some, you know, some of us boys, you know, being us young Aboriginal boys at the time, when we see them following us, so we start um, chucking a few things around the shop. We say, here, now you've got an excuse to come and harass us. Now we can confront each other. We don't have to hide behind, um, you know, this, this subtle discrimination because most of the discrimination is not direct. It's indirect. It's them coming up to us in, in an informal way, but we, we know we're being monitored. We know we're being watched. So what we do is we hark up. So you see those Aboriginal young ones particularly, they'll hark up. You'll see them on the train because they're acting out because they feel that there's something, you know. So they'll, they'll say, all right, you want an idiot? You want a, you want a, a monkey? I'll, I'll show you what a, mon a monkey's like. And I see a lot of them have done that because I was, I was one of those boys um, back in the day. Our people, they don't present to organisations. They don't present. They only present in crisis. They, so when they come, they're coming at, in crisis because they don't feel comfortable coming at this early stage where we need to get them. You know, when they're developing this, th these um, issues and problems, we're getting Aboriginal people, a lot of our people, right at the end when they're in crisis. And that's when, and that's when they meet and then they collide and then they walk away and they go, no, nah, I don't want it. I would just say that they need to, they, what they're doing is, what you're saying is a good job, but they've got to take a back seat and say, how do we do it? That's going to be... Um, oh, they have a little bit of trial that isn't that involved, but yeah. for some reason... Well, they, there's the problem. People yeah. Having the older control. Yeah, they've got to do it, they've got to do it properly. They're a billion dollar co company that, yeah. that comes from the UK. Um, they're only do, they only got a mining tenement, which means they only lease the land. They don't own the land. If anyone, they, the traditional owners own the land. And so they have rights to royalties, um, which is, is not really that much. Um, and those tribes up there, compared to my tribe, my tribe's like 20, probably about 30,000 people, where their tribe's more like 1,500, maybe 3,000. But I mean, the discrimination was that there were jobs there, the Aboriginals put the yeah, yeah. But this mobile tribe or whatever yeah. they want to call it wouldn't allow them to employ anyone outside. Yeah. Okay, okay, I'll break it up again. So if my tribe's 30,000 and their tribe is 15 or say 3,000, which is probably about right, now you look at how many eligible men are within that gap. So you're probably looking at maybe 500 people and people can decide whatever they want. Some might be, want to be a doctor or a nurse and, and that's their right. They don't have to go into, some of our people don't want to work where they're destroying their sites. Rio Tinto has lost their reconciliation action plan just not long ago because they were being disrespectful. There was, a, there was an Aboriginal trust from New South Wales that's got about 200, nearly quarter of a billion dollars that they took off their shareholders of Rio Tinto and they said, we don't want to be part of Rio Tinto and they've, and they've removed their, 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 their quarter of a billion, and they said, we'll put it somewhere else and invest. The Aboriginal people of Australia is like Europe. You've got Flemish people, you've, which is Julia's mob. You've got Scottish, you've got Germans, you've got French, you've got Flint, Finnish, and our tribes within um, WA, there's about, um, about 100 tribes in WA. And each tribe controls their own area on a tribal sense may not be recognised by the Australian government, but it's recognised by us. And for us to destroy someone else's land, you know, it, it, there's some ethics and morals, especially from traditionalists. And there are a lot of our people that are traditionalists. Not all of us, but so, a lot of us that will say, no, we're not working for the mining. We don't agree with mining. And there's a lot of white people that don't agree with mining. So, and that's their right. But I just think that a big company like Rio has to take a back step, step and say, hey, this is not working, how do we do it better? And they will get maximised 
with a small group like the Injabadi, for an example, up in Roeburn, the, um, you know, they're not a big pool of people. We're not talking about millions of people. We're only talking about 3,000 people. So if you've only got 500 people to try and look at scope, it's not really that much. And they want to be, they could be whatever they want. They can be doll bludgers, whatever they want to be. That's, that's their right. And I don't mean it like in a negative doll bludger. They're probably right to be on their own country and, you know, hunting the marlu, the kangaroo, you know, or, or what, however they're doing. Or they're probably dealing with their own issues mentally because our people are, are, are suffering big time. So what, yeah, so what I'm saying is the expectations are here. You've got to have your HR, you've got to have your manual, at least your manual, and you've got to, and, and most of our, a lot of our people um, don't even have licenses. And that's just the reality. And because a lot of our people, instead of going through that proper process, they'll go and drive around because they have to drive the mob around to go, you know, the next minute he gets pulled over and gets a ticket and he's like, shit, I've done that because of you, you silly, you know. But that's our people because we love our mob. You know, someone needs to do something, we'll go and say, oh, well, I'll, I'll drive you. I don't, have, I don't have my license, but I'll take that risk because your health is more important. And then they get pulled over and then they, all this stuff happens. Yeah, and, and it sounds silly, but sometimes our people are in survival mode. So if you understand survival mode, you understand some of the rationales. So because a logical person would have said, well, you've got to do these couple of steps first. Just be patient, you know, but in survival mode, things, things happen. Are there any other cultural pro protocols or things we need to talk about? to make this training safe and effective for everyone before we start. So as you know, we haven't even started. <laughs> I can talk. So when I'm talking, I'm talking about the Southwest. I can't really talk for any other area except where I come from. So cultural awareness is like, I'll teach you about my people. Cultural safety is you learn about yourself. So today is really about us learning about ourselves. The interpretation means we look at the individual as a complete person using cultural safety, making them feel welcomed. You know, um, how do we show hospitality to a person that's damaged or a person that has issues or problems or coming for help and support? How do we make them feel welcome? Um, you know, and, that, and that's, and a lot of services do pretty good, but with that we're being, um, you know, safe for everyone, making people feel safe and comfortable. So for an example, if I was to talk to Julia and Julia's boyfriend, Mark here, and I'm talking about their Aboriginal, so if I went straight up to Julia and go, hi, how you going, how you been, blah, 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 yep, take your seat here, how do you think Mark would feel? Because our people are jealous. Our people have been disrespected because I should have talked to Mark before I talked to Julia because that's culture and it's showing respect for the couple. I need to talk to Mark and the way I talk to Mark needs to be done in, a, in an appropriate manner, not in a, in a direct confrontation. It has to be done with respect and it talks about eye contact. You don't look at an Aboriginal person too long. You look at an Aboriginal person too long, could be seen as a, as a confrontation. It has, even when I'm looking at Mark, I'm not looking at him straight direct. I'm actually looking at him going, oh, hey, how you going? And it's, it's in that humble, respect way. And that maybe Asian cultures may be similar, you know, in showing that respect to eye contact and that I'm not being too direct. And I'm not going to Julia, because she's a pretty girl, for an example. I'm going to this couple here and I'm talking to the man because I'm showing that respect. So just little things like that, you've got to be mindful of when you're working with Aboriginal people. Would it be disrespectful if we spoke to Mark? No, you speak to Julia. Yeah. yeah. So in our culture, no matter which part of Australia, and I'm talking about jealousy, and I don't see jealousy as a negative thing, it's res he's, he's protecting her. And, he's, and, and, we're, and it's just culture. So don't see jealousy as a negative. Jealousy is a, in, a, in a positive way. Um, it's just that's the English word I'm trying to use 
to say that he, we have to go through Mark. I have to go through Mark. Most of you in the room have to go through Julia. So that's just an, that example of that. Where I come from is the biggest gold mine in the world. It's called Newmont. My grandmother's born not, not in a hospital. My grandmother's born on a traditional birthing ground on the Hotham River, what they call the Hotham. We call it the Wannering. That's our traditional name for that river, which is the Hotham River, which is Boddington Gold Mine. It's the biggest gold mine in the world. And um, they make billions of dollars every year. And um, they, they give us, I think it's about 150,000 a year. One person here could probably make 150,000 a year. That's like a CEO of, a, of an organization, of a small organization. Gets about 150,000 a year. That's about 0.01%, maybe 2%. So it's not even 1% of the profits. But that's what they do. That's what, how they, um, they manipulate negotiations and um, they manipulate our elders. And our elders feel that, well, this is what they're giving us. We've got no other choice but to say yes. They've given us no other options. Where if I was, <laughs> you know, I wish I was there, I would have said, no way, you can go along, get lost. We'll go and protest and burn every road that we can, you know, whatever, you know, but that does happen around the world. They do. They do, but I don't know. There's some shifty lawyers. And I, we, don't, you know, we don't know what they're getting under the table, but I can tell you there's been a lot of shifty deals right across Australia. This is not just because it's here. And like I said, I come from the biggest gold mine in the world. My grandmother's born just there. And where she's buried, we're watching the pack trucks go around, um, right next to the Boddington Cemetery. You know, and I'm sitting back going, how are my people resting in peace here? You know? So what we're saying is government's got to do government. We don't want to be involved in education, child protection, the justice system. There's all legislation and there's a regulatory body and, and they have their resources. But what we're saying is there is tribal businesses and I'm hoping that that shift will be through the legislation because you can't change legislation overnight. And, and it protects it. And if we get a regulatory body that oversees our legislation, then we can do with our language. We can do with our cultural stuff. We can do with our tribal business, which is different than those, those other pillars of government, what they do. But, so what it does is it adds value. Because we've got an, a great, you know, if you go to Queensland, you'll get great Aboriginal experiences. You know, like at Jabakai and Cairns, if you've ever been there. And, um, and, and, and there are places where you can go and get an Aboriginal experience. And that's just in tourism. So I'm hoping that the shift will be in the near future is the power is within the legislation that enables us to do our business. Because we, we can be involved in things like tourism. So that's just an example. No, no, what, the elders will always play their role. So I'm not, what I'm saying is we need to, the elders need, need us and we need the elders. So from our perspective, we need to work together. And I'm hoping that we create that systems and the structures and, and, and you know, to, to enable us. And I think as a community that's happening, it's just that we got a, a bum fight with the government. Yeah, no, no, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of, at the moment, so you know, there's a lot of undercurrent going on and there's some setting up going on because there has to be transfer of land, which is going to happen shortly. And um, we, we, we need to be smart. So for an example, I said, I said at a meeting at Beckenham just the other week, because um, I'm going to facilitate this upcoming meeting, but I just said, you know, like, we could potentially get some land and develop a shopping centre in Perth, as an example, with some land that we're hoping to get. So if we play smart economics, we can create... Um, uh, an investment that gives dividends for our people so we can do our language, so we can do our cultural stuff, so we can do our healing stuff. But we have to be smart not to just grab anything. We need to, and that's what I, and because the government is going to be trickling some money into our, into our trust very soon and um, we just need to be smart in what we want to do on country.
we, we can see from past, fa past attempts, past failures. And so what we, as the Southwest Aboriginal person, what we have the opportunity is to learn from other examples. What's happened in Alaska, what's happening in the United States, what's happened in New Zealand, what's happened in other parts of Australia. So that's where we need to be very smart now and saying what's happened. Because even, um, even in America, they've got um, Native Americans that own a number of casinos and they're making a killing. But then my community said, why do we want to do that when we're just stealing off? You know what I mean? It was more of a moral where we said, you know, because we did have that discussion the other week. You said, and, and our people said, we can't hurt another person. It's not all about the money, but it's all about trying to do some stuff so we can do some other stuff. So it's no longer called native title. Guess what it's called? Naive title. My people call it naive title. We don't even call it native title because it's so watered down, the intent or the preamble no longer does what it, what it says it's done. And that's what government does. And that's why they call it the WIC decision, the Yorta Yorta decision. And even, even my people was in the high court only last year. And we won our court case twice in the high court. So um, native title, you know, sounds fancy and all that. And if, I, if you was to do a Google search, most of our land in this area of my country, um, it's either national park, it's either pastoral, it's either private, um, but they need a few dots to tell the United Nations that, hey, we do have, um, um, people do have native title rights and we have a couple um, pieces of um, land, usually near rubbish tip or contaminated land or whatever. So be careful even when they say there's some land because usually the, it's a very low form of land tenure. No. They're talking to the wrong people, to be straight out. Yeah. Because I would never put an ab... Uh, I wouldn't call it Yagan Square for respect for that. Well, this is so, so cultural protocol, yeah. cultural safety is making sure we do things right. So when I look at that, is that an English word? It, what, is it, what, what is the actual name of that tree? It's a tree. It's called a mahogany tree. The traditional name is called Jarrah. So it's actually correct. It, in English, they call it the maho mahogany. Do you know the traditional name for the marin? Anyone, any use court marin? The traditional name for marin is marin. Do you know the traditional name for carry there? Carry. They're actually our names. Jogi is just a little um, prawn, freshwater prawn. Yeah, and, it, and the marin is a freshwater crayfish. I, I just think dual naming is important. So when I looked at that, which I, this is the first time I've done training here, and I'm looking and I'm going, it'd be good to have both names so people can understand that um, it's actually, the English word is actually mahogany. Um, but that, but that's, that's what I'm saying. So English has Arabic, English has Latin, English even has our language in it. And you see there with those three doors. So you've got places like Ongarup, Tambalup, Karanup, Kojanup, Joondalup, you know, all the ups and all the ins, they're all our names. Even when people say Yagan, they should say Yakan, because that's the phonetics. Phonetics is the sound. So, you know, it's, it's lazy English, because I always tell our, pop, our people, say it properly. You know, I'll sit there and I jar them, because I've got an old spirit, and I've got the old ways, traditional ways. Yeah, up, up in our language means place of. So, um, for an example, Ongarup, which it really means Yongarup. So it means place of the grey kangaroo. So you've got Tamblup, Ongarup, Nangarup, Kojanup. You just go all the, all the ups. Yeah. And Ng is a, is a, so we've got a place called Brookton. We call it Kalkarning. It's named after a falcon, Kalkarning. So um, Northern, we call it uh, Narakan. Kings Park, we call it Kakara. 
Tata means a hill, and the car is a, is a trapdoor spider. So this is here because it's cultural safety, and it's saying that it, it acknowledged, you know, there's a warning that there may be um, some images and voices of deceased person. That's a correct protocol for our people of four individuals that talk about country as a way of their connection and their, their healing. And there are a lot of Aboriginal people that are not, they're not actually on country in Perth. And some of them need to go back home and do their healing and do their reconnecting, uh, the, their, their, their alignment, which I'll talk about in a minute. But um, what memories did people have about their youth or what gave them strength? How did people talk about connection to country and culture? So, I Yep. 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 So you're from Britain, but we know the Scots are from Scotland. So when that lady was saying, I need, I'm on Larrakia country. Where's Larrakia country? Darwin. So when we say Larrakia, we didn't say Darwin. We don't say Darwin. We say Larrakia country. So when she was talking about, you know, that when she was on Larrakia country, that, that wasn't her country. So in Britain, we know the Scots are from Scotland. We know the Taffies are from Wales or the Welsh or the Geordies are from Newcastle. You know, all these different groups of people know where they come from. And in England, you, no matter where you come from, they know, they know who they are. The Geordies know they're from Newcastle. The Taffies know they're from Wales. So our people, you just look at that map, we know exactly where we come from. We know exactly where we belong. And our people need to be reminded they need to go back home. You as a practitioner, be good to prompt them because they, they are coming to you in crisis. They're not coming to you just because it's a, it's a great day. They need help and assistance. And by prompting them, is a great way of saying, when's the last time you've been home? Or where is home? Where's your mob from? You ever thought of going back, you know, just to just recharge those batteries? Because there's a lot of things going on here. In counselling, 90% is listening. 10% is doing. So we, if you were to say, let's do, heard of CBT? Did you get taught, taught about that? So yeah. cognitive behaviour therapy? That action plan and that strategy and that review should be predominantly developed by your client. So how you facilitate that yarn, that discussion, is, is by getting them in, in saying, well, what, what do you, blah, 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 what's the issue? And then that's how you develop the action plan and, and, and help them through that, that process. Well, because of native title, pretty much all of them should most of them should know where they come from because the, the evidence, the research, the, the files. So a lot of our people were, so we've heard, we've heard of Department of Child Protection. What was its first name? It was called the Aboriginal Native Welfare Department. It's now called Child Protection, Department of Child Protection. It was Native Welfare back in the day. And our people... Um, we're monitored, we're written up, um, told who we can marry, where we can go, and trust me, all that information has been, we've got all that. They try to bury a lot of it, they try to destroy a lot of it, and um, things were found even in rubbish tips. And that's only um, stories from around my area, which is, um, that was in Narigen. Um, they were trying to burn files, and our people um, would, you know, saw it and some of them, I didn't even, actually, I didn't even know if they grabbed it, but they were looking at people's files and they're like, oh my God. No, no, first you say, how are you? Are you okay? You know that campaign, are you okay? That's a great, so just having these words that, that gets them, prompts them to have a yarn with you. You know, sit down with them and how you make them feel comfortable, you know, how you sit in and position yourself. 
You know, we, when I used to work for child protection, because I used to work for them, I would never park my car in the driveway because my self-care comes first. When I'm working with a client, I never turn my back on them because that's my protection and self, self-care. You know, um, a, a lot of these, you know, there's this, um, I guess there's a bit of a stereotype, blonde hair, blue eye, just come out of uni and they're working with our community and very naive in some ways, you know. Um, just you ought, to, you ought to have your guard up, you know, but not, but your, your aura, they'll read your aura. So you could have your guard up, but you could just be strategic about it, you know, because your, your safety. So one of your safety is go with another work, work colleague because a lot of these workplaces, they'll say, you go and you work with that client. But I always say, yeah, a little bit of that's okay, but always have a worker with you where possible. So you can, you know, particularly like a home visit or stuff. So, you, you know, you've got to protect yourself. Even I've got to do it. Even, when, even where I sit, I, I'll sit closest to the door. If I have to sit down in that house, I'm next to that door. Because if anything goes, I, I'd rather be there so, than being trapped in the door. So, you know, just little things like that you've got to be mindful of. Um, and see, a lot of the towns, because there's a lot of towns in Australia, and tribes were brought in there. And then what the system did, it started breaking us up. So they, they you know, even with um, intermarrying with uh, Europeans, so, so with me, I'm mixed, but my heart's black, my mind's black, everything's black because that's the way I was brought up, okay? And, um, but my, my skin's been diluted because of my beautiful queens and my beautiful grandfathers that came from other parts of us of the world, loved each other, were ostracised because they weren't allowed, they weren't really, um, so, they, so he was outcast. And I'm thinking about my great grandfather, who was a white man, who loved this beautiful um, woman. She was my great grandmother, but he was outcast for it. You know, not by the Aboriginal people, but by the system and that community, which is very sad, disappointing. But that's, that's the nature of that, that time and era. Um, so there are towns where um, you have half castes, you have um, full blood Aboriginal people, and, and it's, a, it's a pecking order. So it depends on who are the tribal group for that area. So, and, and then, that, then it gets all through that pecking order. It, it, uh, the word actually is a Latin word. So Aborigine is, is the old word because a lot of English, Latin is very, so that's where I guess, I mean, it, they said terra nullius as well. Terra nullius was a myth and it got debunked and that's how native title came because they said that there was no one in this continent. It was terra nullius. It was null and vo- it was void. There was no people in Australia. So that gave justification to the international community at that time, which was the European powers, to say that they had right to take this land because there was no one in here. And that's that Terra Nullius was, was debunked in 1992. So it went for nearly 200 years that they said that, um, that doctrine of Terra Nullius. But we had to fight it because we've got to fight every step, every argument we've got to fight it because it's, it's all in the system. It's in the rule book. When, when I talk about limitations, so people are going to come to you with a whole bunch of issues. Sometimes you don't have the answer. And it's okay to say, I don't have the answer. I'll get back to you. So I was actually doing it as a, just a, thanks. thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so just be careful. Just like, I'm just saying like, you might have a general, but you know, it's, it's actually our, it's a religion. It's, it's, it's the Aboriginal religion. So, um, but it's, and it's very complicated. Not complicated, but, um, yeah, very... Because um, I, I, you see it in the schools and a lot of the teachers will um, tell some stories. You know, they've got their books and they're tell, showing the, um, the young fellas about story and you just sit back and go, oh, my God, that's a man's story. That's only for men. That's not for little kids. You know what I mean? So you've got to be very careful... 
Um, in that, when you go into not the secular, but the religious element, because there's men's business, there's women's business and stuff like that. In our culture, we had issues, but we sorted it out. Because customary law had broken down, and that's where the feuding doesn't get sorted out. But in traditional way, <clears throat> our people would, the worst case scenario is they would spear that person back in tribal way. And then the issue was sorted out and it was never discussed again. And the person that speared you also had to heal you. So it was not only a punishment, but then that person had to care for that, the health of that person to get him recovery. So it was a beautiful way of also saying, hey, we're not putting up with BS, but we're also going to make sure that person learns. And then the, he starts complying or she starts complying with the, the norms of society. So when I'm talking about love and care, it's just basic, doesn't cost anything. So, so there's people up in Uluru where that, that young lady was talking about on the film. She's from Uluru. She's from Murujulu, which is right next to Uluru. It's, it's an Aboriginal community just right next to Uluru. And they are the traditional custodians for Uluru. Bob Hawke, back in 1986 or something, promised Uluru to be given to him, but then he backflipped. So they've got a 100-year, um, which they've got to wait another 60 years. And they said, well, we'll wait 60 years because Uluru will come back to us because he made a promise and he, and he lied to us. So they're still waiting for Uluru. I don't even know if they'll get it back, but in their heads, they said, no, we'll get it back. So even the management of Uluru is kind of joint management, but it's slowly going towards 100% Aboriginal control. They've already sorted out about people walking up at Uluru, which you can't, can't do anymore because they're starting to take that control back of, um, of, their, of their site. It's, it's, one of the, it's probably the sacred site in Australia. My question to the group, did we have alcohol before Europeans come? Hands up. Can I just have hands up? Was there alcohol before Europeans come? No. So hands up. So you are saying yeah? Well I, well, I can tell you there's boys in prison that are fermenting right as we speak, alcohol in prison. So I can tell you we fermented stuff as well. The Bankshire tree has nectar where the honey comes and eats, but it's seasonal as well. And our people used to ferment it to make alcohol, but it was only in season. And our people did it for, for stuff. We also, even tobacco, every nation in the world had alcohol. There was, every nation in the world has alcohol. Every nation in the world, I'm talking about tribal groups, whatever you want to call it, have nicotine. What my people do in Australia is we chew it with a bit of ash and whatever, with a, with a certain nicotine bush. So that is a, just want to just let you know, we're not talking about white people, we're talking about government. Because that government took my old, my old grandfather from England in chains and brought him here. So if he can do that to his own people and do it for the, to the, 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 the first peoples of Australia, then we're not talking about, it's not race, we're talking about the structure. That's about that reconstruction, deconstruction. So it's just food for thought because it's new learning. What I'm trying to say is words are powerful and they have meaning. Remember I said about Aboriginal and normal and abnormal? It's just, um, it's just a food for thought. Just, you know, because we're, you know, we're obviously learning and these words are being placed at certain times of, you know, certain eras. And it's just interesting to understand reconciliation, and I'm talking about, because you may work with perpetrators and victims. Colonisation, there was an aggressor who came to this country, and they're my ancestors and they're our ancestors, because I am also of convict origin. So I love that. I can say, you know, I love West Ham, because I know that this guy, who was a collard, my last name's Collard, 
He was from the parish of Hornchurch in Essex. He came here in 1853 on the ship Remilius. I, he got his ticket of leave. I've got all this idea of, of my old pop that came here. I know what ship he came on, where he, where he came from, and that's why I go for West Ham. You know what I mean? Because I'm proud of that heritage to know that, but that's not who I am. I belong to my Aboriginal family, but I respect my history as a, 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 that connection, and I respect that. But, but I'm not going to deny the fact, me as a person, and my people are not going to say that, that there was an invasion. There was an invasion. And so reconciliation, you, words are powerful because it's like, well, the balance of power, so if we're working with perpetrators and victims, we have to be careful with, um, with, with words. So when we look at social etiquettes, I did mention today about um, son-in-law, son -in-law, mother-in-law, where there was, where it's total avoidance. And a lot of um, Aboriginal people um, in Western Australia still practice this system. So when people sit a certain way, don't ask them to face you or, you know, when I was at school, I didn't look at the teacher. So I got, I got, um, you know, got really told off about, hey, when, I, when I'm speaking to you, you look at me. Don't, you know, like eye contact for our people is not a, you know, we don't look too much. If we look too much, we could be, you know, could be other reasons. So either a confrontation or sexual. So it's very important that um, it's, it's passive, you know. Um, so when I was talking about the dreaming to that, that, that participant up top here, yeah, um, I, just, I was thinking, is her name Claire or something? No? Claire. It was Claire. So when Claire was talking, I was trying to get into um, what's her understanding of the dreaming. So if this is a tribe... This is a tribe, this is a tribe, this is a tribe, this is a tribe, and the song line is called Kangaroo Dreaming. So it went from one part of Australia to the other part of Australia. So this clan group <coughs> controlled this part of the story because this is how the story started, but then the story started changing because stories change, and then this, this tribe takes over the next part of the story, then they, they, and that's called the song line. So that's how we connect with what that old fellow was saying we can connect with people hundreds of miles away because of the song line and the different tribes hold part of the story. Um, song lines start everywhere in Australia. We got seven sister dreaming just down in Fremantle. There's seven hills in Fremantle and that's the start of the seven, seven sister dreaming that goes all the way towards Sydney. Yeah, you got the carpet snake dreaming that we believe that created the Swan River. That's our old people's belief about creation story of the of the Avon and the Swan River that started just east of Pingley. And it's actually quite interesting because not only because of the name of the lake, which means up, it's called Lake Yeraling, but Yera means up, Yeraling. And at Yeraling, it if you look at it in an environmental way, it's actually where the Avon Swan River starts. And our old people knew that. And so they gave stories to, to, to things. So it's quite amazing how it links up scientifically and, 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 cult, and with our stories. When I talk about my wiren, in uh, the Kimberleys they talk about their liarn. And when we talk about our wiren, it's, it's, like, it's like that intuition, that inner voice. It's our conscience. It's our helper. It's our guide. So sometimes... People that you will meet, their wearing is a bit off. And what you do as a practitioner is you help correct that spirit. So that's what I'm talking about. And we have that as part of our cosmology and part of our understanding. When, we look, when I look at someone, I'll go, he, his wearing is, is out, of, out of whack. Okay? So when you ask for that, that fella said, oh, can I have $5? I guarantee you, he's, he's probably his wearing is a bit out of whack, which means there's things going on with him. And with the right help and intervention, particularly like young people, if we can get young people early, we can maybe help them. Because 
Sometimes recovery is like 20 years later, 15 years later, and they go, I want help, when really they needed help here. So we need to get really into them. There's stories like that all around the world. Someone's talking about the Bible before, the book of Jonah, he ran away and got put in a whale. So these stories of running away from your issues when you, should, you have to confront it. So the longer you running away from your issues and doing drugs or whatever, um, because they're avoiding their issues. So a lot of our Aboriginal girls have been abused and they're out there doing drugs. They're not dealing with the issue. They have to confront their issue. So that's what I'm saying to you guys as practitioners is you've got to help figure out what the hell's going on because you've got an intake form that gives you a little bit of information about this client. But then you've got to bring it all out of them by effective questioning and making them feel safe. You know, obviously you've got to tell them their rights under confidentiality, privacy, blah, blah, blah. But then you've got to get to the nut and core and she will tell you what's happening. You just got to work from a strengths perspective. When, so if you're, from, if you're from another part of country, strengths perspective says you need to go home. You need to confront your issue. You're done wrong, you need to confront the family. And if that means getting speared in the leg, then you need to do it. And, you know, that's the worst case scenario. But some of, some, of the, some of people that are coming to Perth are escaping accountability that need to deal with back home. Yeah, so I've got probably 20 minutes with you. So I'm gonna just give you a couple more um, tips, but this is a good understanding that our people have words for, for our for stuff as well. So even um, uh, this is a, a good one, because you user, user, user are a Yulin. You're a counselor. You're a good, you're a community practitioner. Use are what our old people would call a, a Yulin. And they're special even within our within our, um, <clears throat> within our um, I guess, knowledge systems. So the Urlin is the one that people go to. So people come to me and burn me out because the system's not working or they don't want to go to that service provider or they're prolonging it or they're doing something, but they'll talk to me. And I say to them, you're too close to me because I've got to have a, I've got to, I've got to have a protective barrier. So I burnt myself out 20 years ago, and then I learned 10 years ago, hey, this is the way I've got to do it. I've got to stop judging because we judge. And so when I learned to become a mental health trainer, and I looked at my three siblings that were drug dependent. Thank goodness my sister's now um, recovering, and hasn't touched it for a very long time but my brother's in Hakia right now and the other brother should be in Hakia because of just their lifestyle. But um, when I go back to the damage, goes back to my stepfather who was stolen generation, sexually abused at New Norsea Mission and, I, and the list goes on. And so that whole family of my stepfather's family, they're all damaged and it all goes back to being institutionalised where my family were kind of, you know, like, you know, pretty strong, pretty strong in, 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 our, in our protecting as a family. But when I look at my stepfather and then I look at my brothers and sister, so in my culture, they're not my half-brother, half-brothers and half-sister. That's, that, they belong to my mother. They're mine. You know, so we don't, we don't, even, we don't even use that word. It's not even thought of. Even my first cousins are my brothers and sisters. Even my second cousins are my brothers and sisters. That's how we are as a, as a, as a I guess, as a kingship s structure system. So these Urlins are out there in the community and they're doing a hard job. Like I said, them, them grandmothers that are caring for those grannies. Um, and and uh, so a lot of our elders are, are burnt out. So people go, oh, let's talk to the elders, let's talk to the elders. And I'm like... Oi, leave them alone. Come to go to them if you need to, but you 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 got to come through us as well, you know, because you're burning them out. Have you learned about post-traumatic stress disorder? And you'll see a lot of with war veterans, and every Aboriginal has got P was it PS. You have to see every Aboriginal person 
Cause of colonization is affected by, by this condition. So that's just one way we're damaged. So the strengths is going back to country, like we said there, you know, um, making our family strong, supporting our elders. Like I said, our grandmothers are burnt out because they're, they're having to care for all these grannies while that the child is, um, or the adult parent is not doing the right thing. I'm not saying with every family, but that, that happens a lot, um, particularly in big families. They're lumped on that responsibility. But there's a lot of strengths, you know, having access to land. So in the Southwest, we've had no land. Everything is locked, lock and key. So with this negotiation process, what we're hoping is we can get access to places like Magumba Mission, like the Pinjara Massacre site, um, which is the, you know, the, the damaged stuff, but then also hopefully we can do some of that healing stuff. But we don't want it to be controlled by um, non-Aboriginal, uh, I guess, entities. So the Pinjara Massacre site is controlled by the local government. So when we were looking at formulating some ideas with it, they were like, the Shire of Murray was like, oh, we want to be involved. And I said, well, why do you want to be involved? You haven't done nothing for decades. What have you done to this place? Nothing. We don't want you involved. Because they had plenty of time to get something, you know, help our community. All right. Do you know what happened in 1948? Check it out. But that's the first time that Europeans became Australian citizens. Before that, use um, or use, I'm saying, <laughs> not use, even us, sorry. That's when our people, um, yeah, do a bit of research on that. It's interesting. Um, only from 1948, Australians were allowed to be called, well, officially, because they had to tie, um, sort everything out. Mm. 1967, that referendum was a big referendum. Um, so in the federal, what's it called? The Australian Constitution, um, it, it gave two powers. It gave, so the federal government didn't do anything for Aboriginal people till 1967. But then it allowed us to vote and for the Australian government to um, um, do some stuff for the Aboriginal people. So what did they do? They went into Northern Territory. You heard of the NT intervention? Northern Territory intervention is first they had to suspend the Racial Discrimination Act so they can discriminate. Against. They had to suspend the Racial Discrimination Act so that then they can be um, so they can discriminate against the Aboriginal people. So they said that the sacred um, children's report gave them justification going to the Northern Territory and they said that there were pedophiles uh, rampant throughout the Northern Territory, which they found out that wasn't the case. There was more pedophiles on the Gold Coast than in the Northern Territory. But they went in there with the army, they went in there with the um, welfare workers, they went in there with the police and they accused the, old, or the whole Aboriginal community from Alice Springs all the way up to Darwin that, that there was a pedophilia rampant in these communities, which was proven false. But that was their way of um, going in there and with this NT intervention. Even in Western Australia, we've, there's been 150 Aboriginal communities closed in the last few years. And none of yous, I'm going to put, just put it to yous, none of yous went out and said, that's wrong. None of yous went out there and said, no, we've got to stand up and this is wrong and, and go out there. So what I'm trying to say is we are so conditioned as people to allow this to happen. So why, 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 can't, why are we closing our communities that were been there for thousands of years? for hundreds of years on country and for the community or the government to, to allow that. And that, that is wrong. And this is in Western Australia. So it's just the food for thought to say, hey, what, 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 what's going on in the Aboriginal space? And it's really interesting. And that's why I really say youth can be a real strong ally. Get yourself um, you know, brushed up and get involved in what's going on in the community because there is a lot of discussion, not only in the undercurrent, there is um, good stuff that government is saying, hey, we actually need your help now. 
They're actually calling for us to say, we need solutions. So yeah, just the effects of colonization that it has on um, clients and people that you will engage with on just have to be mindful of their, you know, the mind, spirit and body and don't take it personally. You're like, if, if someone's coming, trust me, remember we talked about that weirin? So that liarn? So if someone's coming into your service um, where you're working, um, just pause, hold space. Don't have to, you ha don't have to have the answers. We all got limitations. Um, if a woman wants to come in and talk about sexual abuse by a man, I don't think I'm appropriate for it. And, and, and I wouldn't, you know, that's my limitations. So you've got to know your limitations and your expectations, um, not expectations. If you promise, like, um, was it you, Vicky? I don't know what someone was saying. Were you saying about promise? Make what you promise do. So a lot of our people have had false promises. And they've sat with it like, a, like, an, like an elephant. Like those people up at Uluru that Bob Hawke um, deceived. They got deceived. And, um, but they're sitting back going, all right, we've got to wait another 60 years. Because I was up at the Uluru conference two years ago where we, were, we said to the government, we want a treaty. That's where the Uluru statement, I drove from Perth, I dropped off clothes at a place called uh, Warburton, and on the other side of Warburton is a roadhouse. And I looked at the jumper there, it was, and it was full sale, and it, they wanted $170 for a jumper that I could have got from this Chinese Aboriginal tourism shop just in Perth here for maybe $10, $20. And that's, so that's the exploitation that's happening. And it's happening right now. Go up to uh, the roadhouse at Warburton and test what, I, what I've said. And, then, and so that's what I'm saying. We've got to be careful how we're conditioned. So if they can get rid of 150 Aboriginal communities in WA and no one said nothing, then they, I'm really worried. And that's the pattern, and it's the pattern for the last 200 years. Well, I've seen my, my people, and I'm, I'm talking about me reflecting and going over history, and I'm looking at my, and I'm like, why isn't the white people stuck? Why aren't they, they should be up in arms to allow that. But when you look at some of the videos, I'd, lo I'd love to show you some videos. And a lot of them, a lot of them um, new Australians, or the second wave of Australians, whatever you want to call them, the Wedgela, um, you know, they're actually, you know, their views are like, oh, they're all right. They live near the rubbish tiff. That's the Aboriginal reserve. That's where they need to be. And that was their views. And I love to show you that to say, look, this is actually what's been said. When you talk about Port Hedland, that's the longest um, strike in Australian history was up in the Pilbara, the Pilbara strike. Go and do some research on it. Because they said, you know, we don't want just flour, milk and tea, the rations. We want to be paid. We have a right to be paid. So, you know, and, and that's, a, that's why, and, and it took, I don't know, months, maybe years. That's how long they striked for, for better um, paying conditions. And that was their right as human or as Australians. What could happen in Perth is that we've already got a legislation. It's called the Noongar Recognition Bill. We just need to convert it into power. We're not saying, we're not in, we don't want to be involved in um, education department or the child protection, all these other legislations. We want to do tribal business. So my, what, if I had a magic wand, it'd be to do the, the business that that's us. So, so when I'm talking, say for an example, education, I'm saying, let, the, let them do their side if they want to do education, then we put that as part of our, um, um, the things that we do. So that could be um, after hours, it could be weekend, um, you know, all that type of stuff that, 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 that we can teach people our language, you know, our culture or whatever. So, so we're not interfering in Australian government business because they've got to do their business. But they also, the legislation needs to make them accountable. So... So the regulatory body that under the Noongar Recognition Bill, this is what I'm saying, if I, if I had a magic wand, that's what I would have, is that there is a regulatory body that oversees that, um, that the, the legislation that we already have, 
that Colin Barnett endorsed and that got enacted in 2000 and whatever it was, 12 or something, um, 2010, and, and that regulatory body makes government accountable. Accountable in a sense that they, 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 they're not policing, but, but they have the right to question, they have the right to advocate and support Aboriginal aspirations. So we're not talking about a takeover. We're talking about them, about you know, letting them know that our values and how how we feel. And because a lot of things, you don't want to get to the politicians. There's bureaucrats in level 12, 10, 12 that can sort it out. Because when it gets political, it, it doesn't go nowhere. So so that's what that's where I think the vision needs to be. Yep. But that's it. That's it for today, anyways, guys. Thank you. Yeah. Mm.